At Five Star Bank, community is at the heart of what we do. Every day we strive to have thoughtful solutions for our customers and help our communities prosper. Honest dialogue about the issues affecting the region is vitally important to that prosperity. We are proud to be part of the conversation and hope you'll join in. For 46 years, Bill Lockyer has been a fixture in California politics. Elected to everything from school board member, assemblyman, senator, attorney general, and finally state treasurer, Mr. Lockyer has seen California and its people from many vantage points along the way. Given his announcement that he will retire at the end of his term, he joins us on Studio Sacramento to discuss the prospects and challenges of the state he has served so long. Welcome Treasurer Bill Lockyer. Thanks, Scott. So, why the announcement right now? Well, uh, it became clear to me. Uh, people asked all the time, can I help in your campaign? What, what are we doing? And, and I didn't like the evasiveness to say, well, maybe, maybe, when I kind of felt in my gut I wasn't going to run. And then there are people that deferred, that said, Bill, if you're going to run, I'm not going to run, uh, but you know, keep me informed. And I want to be fair to them and let sure. them have a chance to get campaigns going. Sure. What's changed for you? Well, I've done all these things. Nothing's really changed in the sense that I love state government and trying to solve problems. But I've been a fiscal manager for eight years, and it's sort of another eight years of that isn't what I want to do. And so, assuming a re-election there, but I, so I, I need to do something different. Right. And it, it, it's really kind of simple. You took the helm of your current position right before the beginning of the worst economic crisis of any of our lifetimes. Yeah. What was the scariest moment? Well, I don't know that it was ever scary, mm -hmm. but the difficult time was when you'd see the necessity of very deep budget cuts and the reticence of policymakers to just do what they had to do to get the budget in balance and being one of the growing up voices that would tell them that's the right thing to do. Um, then secondly, when the feds were talking about the bailout of the banks and it was very controversial with people. Sure. And I would get calls from Congress people that say, do we need to do this? And I'd say, well, you know, you're in Congress, not me, but it looks like if you don't do it, the depression is going to be really bad and the uh, unraveling of finance much more significant. Rahm Emanuel, the mayor of Chicago, mm -hmm. said at the beginning of the crisis, he coined a now famous line, which is, never waste a really good crisis. <laughs> and did the crisis force decision making that you think ultimately w is helpful for our state or or did we not did we get up to the corner of the line and blink well there's two halves mm -hmm. okay the state did what we have to do and now we're seeing the benefits of that now the cuts in state and local government uh, for California are about twice as deep as the national average so we re they really had to make deep cuts here compared to others, and, but we're now coming out of it. The federal program, unfortunately, was uh, turned over to every congressional subcommittee. So the investment program to try to get the economy going again got spread out by every little piece of Congress rather than having a kind of coherent, smart, targeted program, they did the politically easy thing to Isn't do. Isn't that known as sausage making? Well, there's a lot of sausages, <laughs> uh, I guess, yeah. The, uh, when, in coming through this crisis yeah. and where the state is oriented today, you've got the long view, 46 years of history in elective office. Mm -hmm. how, how, how is the state of the state today from your vantage point? Well. The, remember, government adds a little bit of value to what's going on, uh, but it's mostly the private sector that drives the engine. And so what we're seeing now is a, a, a terrific pickup, more jobs being created in California than 
almost anywhere in the country at a faster rate, construction's uh, coming back finally. So we're looking at some good years. Mm -hmm. um, demographically, the state is very different today than it was 50 years ago. And I think that's exhilarating. We've done what the country did, which was skim the planet for centuries, bring the risk takers and the dreamers here. And so we have a unusual cluster of that. Now they don't herd very well, but they're inventive and creative and it's great. So right. that's a good thing. Uh, state government, it, it, we're actually about the fourth thinnest state government in the United States. Really? Yeah. So in terms of number of employees per capita, they're, uh, the, all of those red states that complain about government right. spending, they're spending more than we are. Well, let me ask you a question. We've been talking about state mm -hmm. spending and government. Mm -hmm. The one office that uh, most people are aware that you had an interest in, yeah. in addition to all the many you've held, mm -hmm. was governor. Sure. If that office had presented itself to you, do you know today what your one or two focuses would have been? in terms of what you would have liked to accomplish? Sure, I, very much like Governor Brown's agenda, I think, that is uh, focused on education, reinvesting in uh, the education system. Our state relies on high value, high educated jobs, and we've been disinvesting, we need to change that. Environment matters, the economy matters. I have a little, um, I guess stronger in interest than most politicians in trying to manage the resources really efficiently and I have my own sort of history of things of that sort where I, I think voters were getting a dollar's worth of service for every dollar's worth of tax. So, now I, that's Brown kinda, does that, that, that too. That's actually brought you a little bit of controversy within your own caucus well, by and large, that's right? Okay, that's okay. That's okay. Yeah. The, um, you, you talk about Governor Brown, mm -hmm. you were around for Jerry Brown 1.0, mm -hmm. and now you're here for 2.0. Mm -hmm. How's he different? Well, I wasn't as close in then. Mm -hmm. I was in the legislature, mm -hmm. but not as uh, adjacent as I am sure. now. Uh, but it, he seemed certainly more focused, more confident about how to manage and what the challenges are, thinking long term, not thinking about the presidential campaign next year. And so those differences show. That probably helps get rid of a few distractions. I think it does. And Here. in fact, it's one of the problems in California is most governors think that they're now a candidate for president. And so there's a lot of distractions that would be better if they just focused on California. Well, you know, that's also true in your, your former life in the legislature. Uh, post Prop 140, all we've seen is a, a churning you know, time, everyone's looking for their next office. Right. You know, looking back in hindsight from today back to when Proposition 140 was passed, mm -hmm. what do you think to the good and to the bad uh, was the result of that decision? Well, the good is a short list, but you know, there has been turnover and so new voices, new people, more uh, minority representation than might have otherwise been the case. There was always some turnover maybe even as much, but you didn't have some of the senior members that added a little spice to the stew. Uh, you know, Frank Lannerman, Republican from Pasadena, who was uh, interested in mental health, or John Vasconcellos and others that did budget. <laughs> and, and budget work for right. a long time. So we, we miss that, So mm -hmm. we, and we all talk about that, the embedded knowledge that's gone. There's two more substantial things. The first is, when you have these rollovers, it uh, amplifies the amount of campaign money that has to be raised. Most incumbents don't have to raise a lot of money to get reelected. They do a little, but it, it's not a compulsion like it is whenever there's a first time I'm running type race. Mm -hmm. And so it just means the system generates more fundraising and because of that derivatively, more special interest influence. The other thing is newly electeds are almost always advocates. It's the na nature, nature of, right. yeah, I mean, I'm gonna go to Sacramento and they've been doing this or that wrong and I'm gonna fix it. <laughs> and so there, 
and the new ones are understandably right. that way, and we always want some of that in the blender, but what you find with some reflection in time is the legislature's the social glue in a diverse society. Really? Where all of the interests, mm -hmm. the regions, the professions, the economic and other philosophies, they all kind of mix together. And so when it works well, everyone can feel like somehow the system accommodates my views or needs. It, 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 not all the time, but enough to make it feel like it's working. You're heard. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Now that means you need legislative leadership that are skilled mediators, because that's really what you're doing. And the advocacy role makes it hard to be a mediator. And so we miss that with the term limits. The other thing that I, I just have to mention is this, is that there is a perception that partisanship is worse today and the lack of people reaching across the aisle to work together toward common solutions than in the past. Is that true or over the, the span of time, are things about the same as just people get forgetful? Uh, people do forget and rec blessedly remember the nice and good things probably uh, through the fog. Uh, but I do recall two things happened. One is I think our constituents now are polarized. So it's not just the electeds. Uh, the Republican right has a substantial voice in the Republican Party that it didn't have before. The Democrats are more reliant on public employee union support rather than private sector support th than they used to be. And so both of those things make for different politics and policy mm -hmm. and conflict. There used to be more time to spend, just spend time together. And friendships and trust and shared perspectives got uh, fleshed out in ways that they don't when you're mm -hmm. turning so fast. Of all the work that you've done, mm -hmm. You know, we go back to assembly member, you were on the school board and with your central committee back in, yeah. in your hometown. What, if you, just quick association, what are the things that you leave behind that you've done that you're most proud of? Well, it's a long, a long list for me. So if I had to just <laughs> winnow the San Francisco Bay Trail, it's mm -hmm. almost 500 miles of recreation opportunity opened mm -hmm. up around the Bay. Um, consumer protection things that weren't, no special interest really cared about, but things like if you're gonna get called for a, a jury, don't keep people there endlessly. You know, call them for one day or if they get onto a panel for a trial, one trial. Uh, if you're expecting people to wait at home for the cable TV guy or the phone or furniture delivery, tell them when you're going to be there within a four-hour window. So there are things like that. that. It's interesting that you would go there because those are sort of Joe Lunchbox, bread and butter type issues. They're and just, you're not talking about some grand yeah. multi-billion dollar thing. That, that's actually surprising. Well, they're practical. And, you know, and then I spend a lot of time working on social insurance things because health insurance and things like unemployment and disability and child care impact people's lives in ways that these sort of grand schemes don't. And I always thought though that was worth my labor. Mm. You know, after 46 years mm -hmm. and when you retire out of this office, is it at all scary to think about waking up the next day and not having a, an elective office to go to? Uh, well, I, I, I don't know what I'm going to do next. <laughs> and so there is this sort of cliff effect feeling. Sure. Um, but I'm, you know, I'm ready for that. It's whatever it is, it'll be fine. Mm -hmm. 2012 was a tough year for you. And so I, I have to ask, how are you doing? Just a personal year? Yeah. Mean? Well, um, you know, my wife has had uh, challenges uh, with alcohol and uh, drugs, and she's recovering. She's uh, handling it, I think, uh, maturely and well, and that created a lot of uh, tensions in the marriage. And um, so I, I, my 
son, uh, Diego Lockyer, who's nine right now, ten in ten days, um, is doing fine. And that's kind of the big thing. Mm -hmm. That's great. That's great. Well, obviously, without, with uh, your schedule slowing down maybe for a moment, it gives you more time to play video games and things like that. And, well, that's, hang what, out with that's what he likes. That's yeah. What, yeah, that's right. Last uh, weekend, we did the American River rafting, ah. which for him was the first time to do that, and mm -hmm. he just had a ball. Wow. Yeah. Okay. The, um, as you look today at some of the issues facing the state, and because you're the treasurer and y you work with the investments of the state, among other things, mm -hmm. where is it that you see opportunity that ha is yet uh, underdeveloped in terms of using the power of PERS and STIRS mm -hmm. to try and advance statewide objectives. What would you like to see happen? Well, we wish, of course, that there would be very robust, healthy returns so that the beneficiaries get the pensions and health insurance uh, that they've been promised. So that that's the Mm -hmm. the aggregate thing. Now, we'd like to do more investing in California and not just global investing as a big pension fund, but make sure that our money and California taxes are benefiting Californians mm -hmm. by investing here as much as we can. In um, my job as treasurer, of course, I do a lot of the bond financing. And so building the schools and transit facilities and levees and so on, I, mm -hmm. we've doubled really what occurred in prior administrations uh, in that respect. Well, it, it made me feel proud to have one of the minority owned firms actually three years ago come in and say, Bill, in three years we've done more business, we've been involved in more deals that you've got going than everything combined since 1906 prior to you. Wow. So I've made an effort to mm -hmm. see that uh, women-owned and minority-owned firms were at the table. Mm -hmm. Well, we need to keep doing that with the pension fund investments also. Right. It, you also, were you also a part of their efforts? It seems like all of peace, not only on the contracting side, but on the board governance side, because one of the things I know that over the past few years they've been focused on a lot mm -hmm. is diversifying board governance. Correct. And really, uh, Controller John Chung mm -hmm. was the most active voice. I supported uh, those efforts. But their uh, corporate activism uh, we see in the big pension funds around the country, and we, you know, there's conviction and some evidence that um, diverse boards and boards where there's uh, shareholder uh, democracy mm -hmm. um, actually perform better long term economically and so those are good things to have and, and uh, we've been, it's one of the policies in the pension funds that we pursue. Mm -hmm. State pension reform has also been uh, the, re the recipient of a lot of attention over the past few years. Yeah. Uh, at this point, are you satisfied that all that needs to be done has been done? Well, there's sort of two flavors. Okay. There's the, there was a time a decade or so ago when there was some corrupt practices, and I think those have been rooted out and the culture's changed and that's good. The law's changed and so on. Then uh, there's the bigger question, I guess, which is, well, do we, are there promises made by policymakers for future pension benefits that we can't? That are sustainable. Yeah. And so that's a different question. Mm -hmm. And there have been a lot of changes in the law in this state, as well as most states in the country in the last year or two, to modify those uh, life expectancies, employee, employer contribution rates, mm -hmm. uh, pension caps, no spiking. Mm -hmm. So there have been a lot of reforms, and that's good. The biggest unfunded liability, and everybody's figuring, trying to figure it out, is health care. So we can do the Rubik's Cube adjustments mm -hmm. with the pension systems and it'll be okay. That still needs to be done, desperately so, with the teacher retirement system because it implodes in probably three decades. Really? Yeah. And so it has to get fixed. And unlike the other public employee, the PERS system, 
where the board can set the contribution rates, the s teacher system depends on the legislature and governor to do it. And they haven't. They don't have the political will, I guess, to make those adjustments. And, and, if they, and they have to. Uh, but the health liabilities are the big unfunded. You know, there's a that's surprising to hear. There's a conventional wisdom that assumes that the passage of national health care reform was going to sweep everything into it and, and essentially deal with all those issues. Yeah. Not so. Well, here's what it means for California. Now, if you looked at what do other states get in terms of federal reimbursements, we're way near the bottom of that list uh, among the states. The formula doesn't make sense. We have a higher percentage of poor people in California adjusted for cost of living than Mississippi or Alabama. You know, we think of California as the land of wealth, milk and honey. Milk and honey. That's right. And the truth is we have enormous amounts of poverty, worse than any state in the country. And so we've got to deal with that in a smart way. And what happens with respect to health care is just the next decade, what we will have to pick up as a state, the difference between the average reimbursement levels for health and what we get is $300 billion. Now that's, I think, unaffordable for the state of California. Wow. And it's a serious crisis. Mm -hmm. There has to be changes in the federal formulas and other things to make the right adjustments. Our congressional delegation is have to f gonna have to fight harder on these matters. They're interested, but there's gotta be more focus and determination to get our fair share. You know, uh, your, the, the breadth of, of the issues that you've dealt with over the 46 years that you've been in public life, I, I wonder, who inspires you? Where, do, where does that drive come from? I, I think it's just natural curiosity. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I, when you know, I just have enormous interest in, <laughs> you know, I, there's 10 mm -hmm. jobs I'd love if I mm -hmm. had 10 lifetimes. But no sort of, no sort of North Stars where it was that there, there was someone who you looked at and you said, you know, well, they made a difference. A high school teacher mm -hmm. was kind of a surrogate mom named Adele Levine, and I think in many respects was the one that got me sort of more focused on politics and public policy, though I had a nascent interest. And my first boss was Assemblyman Bob Crown from the Bay Area, who was a mentor and a wonderful, smart, ethical leader. Mm -hmm. and, and today, if you were looking uh, at young people who, are, who mm -hmm. were interested in public service, mm -hmm. what would be your advice to them? Uh, get involved. Engage. Just get involved. You know, find a campaign or a candidate that you have an interest in or a, an issue that motivates you. Just do something more than your personal stuff. Just get, be a good citizen. Do you think that uh, our younger generations, what do you see in terms of their involvement? What gives you pause? What gives you hope? Well, there's a lot of interest. Mm -hmm. um, and so I teach one class at USC, and I see uh, my students who uh, are really interested in public service and they'd like to figure out how to have those kind of careers somehow, not necessarily elected, but that are publicly relevant. They worry about, gee, where's the job for when I get out of college, and what about my student loans? Right. And, you know, there's things like that. But, right. but um, I'm hopeful about that. What is discouraging is how little interest there is of the general public hmm. in being informed and involved citizens. We know at election time, we try to get them interested and you wind up with a Los Angeles mayoral election where if you get 20% of the voters even voting, it feels like it was okay. That's terrible. People lay that off on technology, entertainment choices, you know, things like that. D what's your theory for what's at the root of that, that apathy? And how do we get people thinking back they in? Don't, thinking they don't count. Really? Uh, yeah. I think, I think it, in some deep way, it's, uh, first of all, I'm busy. Mm -hmm. And probably lives are 
busier than they were. We in the United States, our work days tend to be longer than in most countries, and family burdens and the number of uh, families that there's a single parent, and, you know, all the reasons yeah. there's stress and time mm -hmm. demands. Um, and yes, all of that stuff around us uh, that is distracting. Um, but I, I think more than that, it's like, well, th this doesn't mean anything to me. I, I don't know who these guys are. Mm -hmm. They aren't doing anything that matters to my life. Right. I think they're wrong, but, mm -hmm. but I, I, and a feeling like, yeah, I, I don't count. My voice doesn't mean anything, so why should I pay attention? Mm -hmm. And in our last few moments, mm -hmm. give us uh, your advice to Californians in terms of what you think are the, the important things for us to do in order to restore our state back to its former glory? Well, keep dreaming, whether it's personal ambitions mm -hmm. or community ones, I just keep dreaming. And, and I guess maybe I wanted to say about that, Scott, that there's never been a big place anywhere on the planet in the history of our species where the fundamental principle was everybody counts, that every voice matters. What a wonderful idea. Now, for those of us in public service, we get to kind of push the edge of that a little bit on gender equality or race or sexual orientation or other things, but uh, people ought to keep that going. And All right, and no. we will leave it there. Okay. Thank you very much, Mr. Treasurer. Best wishes to you and best wishes for the future. Thanks. Well, that's our show. Thanks to Bill Lockyer for being our guest, and thanks to you for watching. For Studio Sacramento, I'm Scott Syfax. See you next time right here on KVIE. At Five Star Bank, community is at the heart of what we do. Every day we strive to have thoughtful solutions for our customers and help our communities prosper. Honest dialogue about the issues affecting the region is vitally important to that prosperity. We are proud to be part of the conversation and hope you'll join in. All episodes of Studio Sacramento, along with other KVIE programs, are available to watch online at kvie.org video.